Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Slavosky, and I work in Congressman Matt Cartwright's office. Thank you for joining Congressman Cartwright's live telephone town hall. A lot has happened since our last telephone town hall on March 25th, so Congressman Cartwright will take your questions tonight about the federal response up to this point since then and discuss the resources now available to Northeastern Pennsylvanians because of the recently passed legislation. We're also pleased to have leaders from our local health care and business communities to help answer some of the more specific health care and economic related questions. If you'd like to ask a question this evening, you can press star three on your phone keypad at any time, and you will be placed in line to speak with a member of our staff. They will take down your name and where you're calling from, and the next time that you hear your name, you will be live on the call and you will be able to ask your question directly to the group. If you're streaming this event on the Congressman's website at cartwright.house.gov live, you can simply type your name and question below the streaming player. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can, but if we're not able to get to your question this evening, you can leave a voicemail after we end, send us an email through the Congressman's website at cartwright.house.gov contact, or call us at 570-341 1050. Now, I'll turn it over to Congressman Cartwright to take it from here. Congressman, go ahead. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, uh, we have uh, some serious subjects to cover tonight. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but always remember if we don't get to your question, um, uh, our office has a, a hotline that we've had open since March 23rd, uh, and we've staggered our hours so that we're able to answer uh, your calls uh, from 9 a.m. until 8 p.m. on weekdays. Uh, and the, the number is 570-341-1050, and I'll repeat that later uh, in this call so you have a chance to grab a pencil and write it down. So since our last telephone town hall that we did on March 25th, a lot has changed, as Matt mentioned. Uh, a stay-at-home order has been enacted for the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, coronavirus hotspots have emerged in our area, as predicted. Uh, and obviously, uh, celebrating Easter and Passover uh, became uh, much more problematic than it has been in years past. Uh, our, life, our lives have changed uh, drastically. Through all of this um, uh, in Congress, uh, we've been working to provide a, a, a voice for the people and small businesses, uh, and I've been doing that for the folks in northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, uh, interested in fighting for prioritizing relief for our medical professionals, our workers, uh, our families, and, and vulnerable people, uh, uh, the particular people who are most vulnerable to the COVID-19 virus. Uh, most recently, we, pay, we passed the CARES Act, uh, a $2.2 trillion package to address the widespread health and economic impact of this virus on everyday Americans. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, I said it was. Uh, this is the first of several uh, such measures. When you shut when you shut down a, uh, a multi-trillion-dollar economy, uh, you learn a lot about what's in the economy. And uh, uh, we knew that there would be gaps uh, in these bills, uh, and that we would be filling those gaps as we went forward. So uh, this, is, this is not a, uh, something that uh, we drilled for, but we're feeling our way. And I think there's, if there's one uh, redeeming quality to all of this, that is that there's a lot of bipartisan uh, feeling, uh, Democrats and Republicans coming together and and, and working together uh, to try to fill these gaps and and uh, try to ease the suffering that, that everybody knows is going on right now. The CARES Act, the $2.2 trillion package, was actually the third bill that we passed in uh, COVID relief. It's a sweeping bill uh, designed to inject uh, $2.2 trillion into our hospitals and healthcare system and put cash directly in the pockets of American workers and families and seniors. 
Uh, it was to uh, make forgivable loans and grants available for small businesses so they can s sustain payroll and stay afloat. Uh, and to boost unemployment insurance benefits uh, for both traditional employees who can apply for that, uh, but also self-employed uh, contractors. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. That was an ambitious undertaking, to be sure. But it's still clear that funding levels have fallen short in some areas. Um, it, it, my own reaction is, wow, $2.2 trillion isn't enough money, uh, but it really isn't. Um, so, uh, for example, small business loans, there isn't enough money in there for, for small business loans for all the, uh, the small businesses we have in this country, um, as well as relief for state and local governments. We don't have enough money in there for those either. Uh, at the same time, I know a lot of folks are still anxiously waiting for unemployment and direct cash payment benefits that this bill promised. Uh, it's a frustrating thing, um, and um, I share that frustration that things are not moving more quickly. Uh, there is uh, obviously plenty of blame to go around, and I'm not going to engage in finger pointing tonight. Um, but our state and federal agencies are working to get these new programs up and running as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, a, a very a clear example of that is that the idea of putting um, uh, self-employed people, uh, contractors, putting them in a position where they're they're able to apply for uninsured, uh, excuse me, unemployment benefits. Um, that that was a good idea, but it, it was one that hadn't been done before. So that not only in Pennsylvania, but in in many other states in the union, uh, the states' unemployment systems were not set up for that, and so they had to make changes. And I can tell you that in Pennsylvania, that was particularly problematic because they had a legacy computer system uh, over 20 years old. They had to search and find um, computer programmers. Uh, who were able to write in COBOL computer language, which is kind of dated, um, and figure out how to change the program so that you could check a new box that said uh, uh, self-employed and uh, applying for uh, unemployment benefits. So uh, th there were a lot of uh, hurdles to get over, uh, but we are muddling through, uh, and uh, I share everyone's frustration that it's not going faster. Uh, tonight, uh, to answer your questions and to help me, uh, we have a distinguished group of medical professionals as well as business experts on the line uh, with me this evening. We have uh, Joe Boylan, uh, Executive Director of Wilkes-Barre Connect, which is part of the Greater Wilkes-Barre Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have Stephen Ursich. Uh, Stephen Ursich is Vice President of the Business Development Services Division at the NEPA Alliance, uh, an outfit uh, headquartered down in Pittston and uh, has done a wonderful job helping small businesses navigate uh, the federal government. Uh, both of these gentlemen, uh, Mr. Boyle, Boylan and Mr. Ursich, have deep ties to this area and a lot of experience in business development. Uh, they're going to uh, be able to help answer questions about small business financing and, and also employment issues. We are also joined this evening by uh, distinguished medical professionals, uh, uh, headed up by uh, Dr. Bill, chief of the medical staff at Wayne Memorial Hospital in Honesdale. Uh, he's practiced medicine in this area for over 40 years. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. John Brinker, senior medical director for primary care in the St. Luke's University Health Network's East Region who has been in practice for 17 years. And we also have a hospital administrator here, uh, uh, Mr. Donald Seipel. Don Seipel is president of St. Luke's Hospital in Monroe County, where he has served in a senior leadership role for the past 20 years. So we are looking forward to your questions, um, uh, but I do want to allow our guests to say a, a couple of minutes each to uh, get the ball rolling and introduce themselves. Um, uh, Joe Boylan, uh, why don't you go ahead and start? Thank you, Congressman. 
Um, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Boylan, and I serve as the Executive Director of Wilkes-Barre Connect, which is the entrepreneurial and economic development arm of the Greater Wilkes-Barre Chamber. And we're also a certified economic development organization within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, and first, I'd like to just thank Congressman Cartwright for hosting this town hall meeting and, and for us the opportunity to participate on this panel. Thank, thank you very much, and I think this is such a critical component to help continue to educate our communities. At Wilkes-Barre Connect, we've really focused on three main components um, in response to COVID-19, and, and hopefully tonight I could be any assistance to anyone on the call with any questions, but our, our three focus areas, uh, number one being financing. Um, we've been a great partner, as you'll hear from, from Steve and Nepo Alliance, they're doing amazing things. And for us at, at, at Wilkes-Barre Connect, we really focused on assisting businesses and applying to the COVID-19 Working Capital Access Program, which is run through the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, in addition, we've really been just a, an advocate or an education hub for those businesses seeking to access federal funding, helping them navigate um, some programs, helping them understand uh, to get them through. Uh, second, uh, we've really put a, a focus on community. Um, we helped launch a community education portal uh, in partnership with eight regional chambers of commerce and in a partnership with Discover NEPA. Uh, the site includes external links to help everyone from small businesses to individuals, providing health and safety tips and, and community resources. I encourage you to visit the site. It's at discovernepa.com, a great resource to help answer questions for you. And finally, uh, the third point uh, component we really focused on is what we want to consider post-COVID and really starting to understand what the new economic landscape will be like and the focus is on workforce alignment. Um, we've been building a strategy now for the past three weeks, working with great folks like the Institute uh, uh, at Wilkes University to help understand where the industries are going to be impacted. And for us, we've already built and uh, set to launch a system, um, as the Congressman had mentioned, some of the systems on the state level are outdated. And so for us, we've uh, pulled together our technology partners right from the Northeast to help build and improve the PA career link system, understanding that um, they are going to have such an influx of requests coming through of uh, displaced workers. So we want to ensure that we have the most up-to-date technology and capabilities and communication strategy to ensure that we can connect job seekers to job providers. And more importantly, uh, we're focused on building training and upskill pathways to ensure that we can assist displaced workers transition to new opportunities when they become available. So finally, if, if we can be of any assistance in any way um, outside of the call, please feel free to visit us on our website at wilkesbear.org with a hyphen in Wilkesbear. We're always here to help and look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Let's go next to Mr. Ursich. Thank you, and, and I want to echo um, Joe's uh, comments. Thank you, Congressman Cartwright, for uh, putting this together. Uh, I think uh, a very important part here is to get information out to everyone, um, and uh, this is a great way to do that. Uh, as the Congressman said, uh, I'm Vice President of Business Development Services at NEPA Alliance uh, in, in our division. At NEPA Alliance, uh, we have an uh, international business assistance program, a government contracting assistance program. Um, both of those uh, assisting small businesses navigate those, uh, those arenas. Uh, and then our lending department, uh, where we are a certified development company. So we are uh, an, an SBA lender. So we understand SBA process, the Small Business Administration, that would be, uh, we understand process and, and what they're doing. So we've been uh, navigating and helping a lot of small businesses try to understand w where those processes are. Uh, as Joe indicated, uh, we assisted uh, the Department of Community Economic Development, uh, helped deploy uh, their uh, CWCA program, uh, the COVID Working Capital Program, uh, and uh, We've been super busy helping a lot of businesses in, in the near uh, last couple of weeks here. Uh, in addition, at NEPA Alliance, we're a full-service economic development agency, so we also assist nonprofits. Um, and 
community development and and those types of um, issues uh, that we're going to uh, that we are experiencing we continue to expect to see uh, continuing and growing need in, in all facets so this evening I, I hope to be able to help small businesses uh, with their loan and lending questions and other uh, areas that uh, small businesses might have as they try to navigate what next in this so again, thank you, uh, Congressman, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ershitz. Dr. Dewar. Yeah, good evening. Again, I'd like to echo my thanks for uh, the Congressman setting this up. It's a very good format to uh, help educate the public about this crisis. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I come from a family of physicians. My father was a family practice doctor in the Lehigh Valley, and then he moved up to this area um, in, in the early 1970s. I did my residency at Lehigh Valley, uh, finished there in 1979, started in private practice in 1979. Uh, I've been a member of the Wayne Memorial Hospital medical staff since that time. Uh, I was elected as chief of staff in 2012 and have functioned in that role since that time. Uh, I still do office work three days a week, and I work in two nursing homes. Uh, one in Waymart, one actually in Honesdale. And between the two places, I care for 90 patients. Um, I also have a physician daughter who works in the St. Luke system at the Anderson campus. <clears throat> and I'm very proud of that. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the one thing we all must remember is this is a very panicked time. We need to stay calm. And if we work together, we can get through this. And I think that's one thing that hopefully this forum will be able to educate the public that, um, you know, like the congressman said, pointing fingers at this point doesn't get anywhere. There'll be lots of time to do what we call in medicine a root cause analysis later to find out what we could have done better and how we'll do it better the next time because there will be something like this comes up in the future. So, again, thank you, Congressman, for the opportunity, and I look forward to being able to help answer some questions. Thanks very much. How about we turn to Dr. Brinker? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, my name is John Brinker, Dr. John Brinker. Uh, I am born and raised in uh, Stroudsburg and uh, traveled down to Philadelphia, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine for my medical degree. Uh, I've been in private practice now for, I should say, I've been in family practice for 17 years. Uh, 11 of those years were uh, in private practice and in six years I have been with St. Luke's University Health Network. Uh, in my current position, I am a family physician two days a week, and I am the senior medical director for primary care for the St. Luke's University Health Network. And in that role, I oversee practices in Monroe County, Northampton County, uh, Warren County in New Jersey, all the way down through Bethlehem and uh, Quakertown. Um, and I would uh, agree with Dr. Dewar that one of the things that um, we need to do throughout this crisis is, is to remain calm. Uh, we in Monroe County have uh, kind of been on the forefront of this uh, invading into Pennsylvania. So we have seen quite a surge of patients, uh, both in our outpatient facilities and our inpatient facilities. But uh, our network has done some uh, great evolutionary things to, to roll with this and uh, we uh, quickly mobilized uh, the week after St. Patrick's Day when this really uh, surged in our area. We started several uh, mobile clinics uh, to evaluate patients who might not necessarily need hospitalization, but uh, maybe should uh, warrant a closer look than just uh, every couple days at their primary care office. We also mobilized uh, testing sites located on or near many of our campuses. So we were able to uh, quickly get uh, a good number of patients tested, and uh, we continue to do that uh, to, this, to this point. And um, uh, again, it's, I, it's great to be here tonight and hopefully share some insight to uh, help people better understand this and uh, maybe add a sense of calm to a otherwise uh, difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Seipel, before we turn to questions. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Don Seipel, I'm the president here at our St. Luke's Monroe campus, and 
Monroe County and Bartonsville. And uh, as Dr. Brinker mentioned, we've seen a number of inpatients come to us with the COVID-19. And I think uh, like a lot of facilities around the country, um, uh, a lot of learning has been going on in the last, you know, since this virus came. And, uh, you know, I can see where uh, the medical community is learning uh, about this disease and, and some of the some of the treatments that we have and how we can use them in a way that benefits our patients. So I would say that we've seen some really uh, increasing wins uh, recently with our patients. Um, in addition to that, we've, we've been really an advocate of public health um, to really hopefully educate the, the community on this and what they can do to help flatten the curve and, and um, get through this. And so I think that's been another piece that we've worked really hard on is uh, trying to support the community again to keep them calm but understand that they have a piece in this and helping us get through all of this. And, uh, you know, it's just um, it's been uh, a really interesting experience, I think, is all we can all say in our own rights. But from a medical standpoint, I've been in healthcare for 30 years now and just um, uh, needless to say, this is unlike anything, any challenge that we've had uh, ever come up against. And, um, it's really, really exciting to be part of this network and see some of the, the work that they're doing to help, you know, really serve these patients. All right, thank you, Don. All right, so now how about we turn to our audience for some questions. First one we have here is from Brenda Lee with a question about the certain types of small business loans available. Brenda, go ahead. Hi, I was wondering if the small businesses can do two of the loans at the same time. Okay, uh, Ms. Lee, thank you for the question. Uh, and and uh, again, the question is, uh, can you get uh, uh, two, uh, can you access two of the different uh, uh, small business loans at the same time? Um, and, and the answer uh, is, uh, and we just had this question come up with a constituent today, and the answer is uh, uh, possibly yes. It depends on uh, whether you can you can show that different aspects of your business are, are applying for different uh, different types of loans. In other words, that you're going you're not you're not just going to pile one on top of another and use them all for um, uh, fungible operating expenses uh, or payroll or whatever it is. If if you have a if you have a distinct way of um, well of distinguishing between uh, which uh, where one loan goes and where another one goes, uh, we think that there's a there's a path to victory there, uh, but it all depends on, on on whether you can pull that off. And I want to defer to uh, uh, Joe and Stephen for their comments on that. Sure, thanks, Congressman. This is Joe um, and Steve. I'll I'll be brief so you could you have much more expertise on this. But from the state perspective. Um, if you uh, did apply to the COVID-19 Working Capital Access Program, you can access and receive that loan program and a federal program as well, so long as the funds are used for different components defined within the loan program itself. So you don't have to choose between one or the other, um, a state or a federal program. You can access both so long as you meet uh, specific guidelines within each. Steve? Yep. Thank you, Joe, and, and thank you, Congressman. I, I'll, I'll uh, echo that, both what Joe and the Congressman said. Uh, in fact, SBA has uh, indicated to us that the difference uh, or, or marrying, if you will, the economic injury disaster loan or the EIDL loan with the Paycheck Protection Program uh, is allowable. And just as the Congressman said, as long as there's a differentiation between the expenses being covered by those two programs. Um, so essentially, for example, the, the paycheck protection could be used for the payroll and the idle loan could be used for um, other costs that the businesses uh, would need to continue operation. 
And this is uh, Matt Cartwright again. I'm going to jump in, and, and for for uh, those of you who are listening in and may not be fully aware of the Paycheck Protection Program, that's a uh, part of the CARES Act that we passed a, f- a few weeks ago. Uh, it provides $349 billion in loans to small businesses. Uh, these are forgivable loans administered through the Small Business Administration. Uh, they support small businesses' payroll and other operating expenses to help these businesses keep their workers employed. Uh, the loans will be issued through existing uh, SBA lenders, in other words, banks. Uh, and I want to stress that these loans can be forgiven if the small business owners use them to keep people on the payroll. Um, another question that did come up today from a constituent uh, was, well, what if the employees put in for unemployment compensation and and, uh, we are counseling people uh, employers uh, tell your employees do not do that if you're going to keep them on the payroll they should not be putting in for unemployment compensation Um, the other part part is that um, 349 billion is not enough money and I I don't know if I ever thought I would say something like that 349 billion dollars is not enough money uh, for loans to small businesses, and that's why uh, I fully expect to go back to Washington and vote uh, time and time again, probably uh, two or three more times, depending on how long uh, this uh, this pandemic goes on, uh, to, to increase the amount of money uh, available. Uh, Matt? Sure. Uh, let's go next to Keith Moss with a question about hazard pay. Please go ahead. Good evening, Congressman. Mayor Moss from Duryea here. I have a question about the uh, hazard pay and how long the hazard pay will last and any idea when it will be passed. Okay. Uh, Yeah, there's an awful lot of interest among my colleagues in the Congress uh, to enact hazard pay. Uh, in fact, uh, I must tell you, I have my own bill that I'll be introducing on Friday uh, that'll include hazard pay uh, for uh, all of the essential workers. Uh, you know, the people out there uh, uh, packing groceries and and driving trucks and and doing the things that that keep us going. Um, you know, there's a, if you think about it, there's an, an inequity going on right now. Um, we have all of these, uh, we have, you know, we have so many people more or less being paid to stay at home and not work. Uh, and that seems uh, inimical to capitalism, but, but this is what you have to do in an emergency like this. People are being paid to stay, uh, stay at home and not work. Uh, and they're all going up the walls because Americans like to be productive. I know that. Um, but at the same time, they're out of harm's way. They're not in danger. The people who are deemed essential employees, they're they're out there, and they could come, come into contact with this virus, and they know it. Uh, and, they're, uh, and they're just getting the same pay that they've had uh, the whole time. Uh, on top of that, you have the healthcare workers who are in the front lines of this war against this virus. You're t- you're talking about uh, first responders and EMTs and and med techs and uh, nurses of all stripes and physicians and the people who have to get up close and personal with people that are known to have COVID-19. Uh, so uh, they are in harm's way, and uh, so many of us on both sides of the aisle in the Congress want to uh, not only compensate the people who are essential employees, but even more so uh, the pe- the healthcare workers who are the heroes in this fight right now. Uh, I have my own bill on that, uh, and, and many of my colleagues do as well. Uh, so uh, how soon that happens, um, I suspect that'll be part of CARES too, uh, because the next one that I think we're going to go back to Washington uh, probably Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week will have to do with uh, with more money for small businesses. Uh, but the CARES 2 package will probably pass uh, in the first week of May. Um, that's just a guess. 
but I know a lot of us are interested in that. And, uh, you know, I, I would like a comment on that from our physicians um, and from Mr. Seipel as well about the, uh, about the hazards that our first responders and our medical providers are, are undergoing in this fight. Hi, this is Don uh, Seipel. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, you know, we when we look at our hospitals and our folks that are going to work in our practices and our outpatient centers, they're they're obviously working with known coronavirus patients, patients in our ICU and our ERs, and you know, we fought really hard to make sure that they have all the personal protective equipment that they have, and they have a lot of the same fears and anxieties that everyone else does, but they. They also have a sense of duty to come and, you know, serve the patients that they, they've always cared for, and uh, there's no doubt. But I also agree with you. I, I I can't help but thinking about the grocery store workers and, you know, some of these other essential jobs that if we didn't have those folks there, um, you know, for groceries and gas, and these are like basic needs that we have, uh, we'd be in trouble. And so they're just as much a hero in my mind uh, being out there on the front lines as well. Yeah, this is, like this is Dr. Dewar. To, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just oh, going to say that I, you know, one of the one of the things that we're starting to deal with in our our small hospital is um, kind of the stress that our our doctors and nurses that are taking care of these COVID patients are are under. Um, we, you know, every hospital tries to limit exactly how many people are associated with the COVID patients, and they keep going in day after day after day. So they. Um, you know, we're starting to deal now with some of the, I don't want to necessarily call them mental health issues, but the stress issues that these people have going on day after day after day, putting up with the risk of, I may come down with this and maybe I'm going to end up taking it home to my family. You know, I agree with Dr. Dewar. I, I really have thought long and hard about this. And when this is all over, you know, some of the lasting effects that are, uh, in particular, our healthcare, our frontline healthcare workers are going to have out of this. I'm really concerned about because um, it is very stressful for them to care for these patients. So, yeah, I echo that. Um, it's, a, it's a real concern. I think we're all trying to do what we can to help them manage their their stresses and their anxieties, which are real, and help them, you know, be there and care for their patients. Um, but I don't think we can neglect the fact that when this is over, there's probably going to be a certain amount of um, challenges that some of these folks are going to have uh, to really work getting past in the future. And uh, this is Matt Cartwright again. Uh, thanks, Dr. Brinker and uh, and, and uh, Mr. Seipel and Mr. Doerr and Dr. Doerr. The, um, the thing I want to add, and thank, thanks again for the question, uh, Mayor Moss, um, is that the CARES Act uh, provided funding specifically for personal protective equipment uh, for um, uh, our essential workers and our our, our healthcare people, um, it provides a hundred billion dollars for hospitals, sixteen billion dollars for the strategic national stockpile, a billion dollars for the Defense Production Act to invest in manufacturing to help in, increase production of PPE. Uh, but it's obvious that uh, more is needed. It's not moving fast enough. Um, not only PPE, but also testing. Uh, we have to. Uh, and, and I will I will be untiring in my advocacy of more testing and more PPE. Uh, last week I co-sponsored a resolution urging the president to make a, make quick and effective use of the Defense Production Act. Um, a, f a few weeks before that, I engaged uh, the office of the U.S. Trade Representative, uh, uh, the U.S. Ambassador to China, and also the the DLA, the, the Defense Logistics Agency urging them to coordinate with our international trading partners to secure more PPE for our country. Uh, these are vital ways of, of uh, supporting those and reducing the hazards. Uh, back to you, Matt. Sure, thank you. All right, next I'd like to go to Mary Lover with a question about COVID-19 testing availability. Go ahead, Mary. Mary, you're live. I'm live now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I've heard the question asked a number of times in enough, a number of different uh, news outlets and so forth, even to the president himself. But I never hear a straight answer. Where are we at on developing and distributing large, large numbers of testing? Where are we at on that? What's happening? And all I want to say. Thank you, Mary. This is Matt Cartwright. And, and um, that's a, it's, I mean, that's a vital question. Um, I know that uh, the administration uh, promised that we would have uh, 29 million tests by the end of March. Uh, they had uh, 2 million by the end of the first week of April. So that's clearly, uh, you know, it's lagging behind. We have to put the, pe the pedal of the metal on that uh, because um, that's the only way we open up the economy is if we're able to test people. We know from experience, and the, the physicians can, can weigh in, in on this, but, but I've, I've been talking to pandemic experts all over the country, and it's clear that there are certain groups who are particularly susceptible you know the uh, the very old people, the people who have lung problems, the people who have you know, cancer survivors with uh, immunodeficiency problems, uh, people who are, are diabetic, people who are grossly overweight. All of these people really, really are at grave risk with uh, COVID-19, and the only way to protect them is by testing the people that they interact with. You know, if we're going to make sure a nursing home doesn't fall victim to this disease. Um, you know, they had entire nursing homes in, in northern Italy, and then we had one in uh, near Seattle uh, and fell victim to that. The way you protect those people is you test those, the, you know, you test those uh, the nurses and uh, aides and, and all of the workers who go in and out of these, these nursing homes, and that's just one example. We need so many of those tests, and that's why, you know, that's why I mentioned, Mary, the... Uh, the Defense Production Act, uh, uh, not only for PPE, but uh, but just as important uh, for uh, uh, expanding the production of these tests. It's absolutely vital because we cannot, you know, we can't keep this economy shut down uh, for great stretches of time. We have to, uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, experts that I talked to was uh, Dr. Michael o Osterholm, who was the chief pandemic advisor to five presidents in a row, he said, uh, because we're going to wait another 12 to 18 months before we get a vaccine, what we have to do is we have to learn how to live alongside this virus. And the only way we do that is with the testing. Uh, Dr. Dewar, uh, Dr. Brinker, do you want to weigh in on those? This is Dr. Um, Dewar. I think that the the testing to me is although it's important uh, right now since we don't have the testing um, and it's going to be a while. I mean, it takes a while to manufacture the swabs to get these things done, the, the reagents to run the tests, and everything else. I mean, you can you can make them as fast as you can. It's just like the PPE, um, you know, you can only make those things so fast, and we're using them as fast as they can make them right now. Uh, but I think that right now that the testing is important, and we will get to that. But I think the social distancing and, and behaving as if, and there's two ways you can behave. Is one, you can behave that you have it and you don't want to give it to somebody else, or that somebody has it and you want to make sure you don't get it from them, which is, you know, wearing a mask, doing your social distancing, washing your hands and everything else. Uh, you know, the testing will get there, but, the, you know, the manufacturing capability is, is limited. They can only make them so fast. And we're use, right now we're using them as fast as we can make them. I would I would agree with that, Congressman. Um, but Mary, to answer your question, uh, when we first started, and, and Congressman had mentioned this, when we first started testing uh, back in the middle of March, uh, we had serious concerns about our quantities and, and how quickly we would deplete those given the number of tests that we would run. Fortunately, we were able to keep up with that uh, and, and our supply chain was able to uh, give us what we needed. The one thing that I think there has to be some concern about is a lot of people have this question about, you know, testing everybody and, and 
one of the concerns, and, and we have to question, is the reliability of the test in a patient who is not exhibiting many symptoms um, and seemingly healthy. If they're not shedding enough virus, the question is how accurate is the test going to be? So we initially we started, we were only testing people that were ill appearing, and um, now there's some there's uh, some discussion of employers wanting to retest prior to returning to work. And, you know, we don't have the, the supplies to, to openly do that at this point. Um, and I think that, you know, until we get a test where we don't need much of a viral load and we can test and we can be assured of, of how accurate it is and, and, of course, quickly returning the results, um, you know we're gonna we're gonna be forced to, as Dr. Dewar mentioned, the prevention is gonna be is gonna be key. Well, uh, Before we get to our Dr. Dewar, and thank you, Dr. Brinker. And uh, what I want to do is I want to take a, uh, take a moment and make a plug. Uh, I want to remind everybody listening about the census. Uh, one thing we can all do while we're staying at home right now is complete the 2020 census. If, if you haven't done it already, uh, you probably got an invitation to participate in the mail last month. Now you can complete the census by phone, by mail, or, or even over the Internet, and you can't believe how fast that is to do it that way. Um, this is why it's important. Here in northeastern Pennsylvania, the only way we make sure we get our fair share of federal dollars uh, which is a you know what I spend most of my time in Washington doing, trying to make sure we get our fair share of federal dollars back here in northeastern Pennsylvania. But I can't do it unless we get a complete count in our census here in northeastern in Pennsylvania, because we're talking about money for our hospitals, for medical emergency services, for all of the broad range of uh, things that federal money is used uh, for in the country. We want to make sure we get our fair share of federal money, so go to 2020census.gov, 2020census.gov uh, for more information and, and get it done. Uh, Matt, uh, more questions. Thanks, Congressman. And before we get to the next question, I just want to remind the people on the phone that you can uh, get in line to ask a question at any time. All you have to do is press star three on your phone and you'll be directed to a member of our staff. Okay, and now I'd like to go to a question that we have on the online queue for the people listening on the website. I have a question from Michael Clifford um, asking if April 30th is too soon for Pennsylvania to begin the process of reopening. I'm going to turn that right over to Drs. Uh, Dewar and Brinker. Boy, that's a, that's a $64,000 question. Uh, I don't know that anybody knows. Um, I think we need to wait a few weeks to see what the how the 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 incidence of cases continues to rise. It does seem at at some point there's a uh, you know we're reaching the peak, uh, but I, I know in, in Wayne and Pike County I don't think the peak has gotten here yet, um, and I, I'm I. I don't think anybody can answer that. You know, that's going to be up to a statistician or an epidemiologist, probably not a probably not a clinician. Um. I agree, Dr. Dewar. I I think that with the way we're seeing this um, this spike, I think the the increase in the number of cases was very dramatic and how quickly it rose. But unfortunately, I think that the decrease is not going to be as steep of a curve. I think it's going to be a much more prolonged uh, resolution. And we're going to have to be careful because we've already known, we know from the history of this that it rapidly spreads. It likes people in tight places. And if we start to, uh, as you've heard um, many people say, let off the accelerator here, we're going to, we're going to jump back and, and we're going to have a resurgence of cases. Um, so I think I think caution is going to be is going to be the, the course of action. This is uh, Don Seipel. I, I just want to add that my concern is if we if we rush this uh, too quickly, um, we if 
could, you know, we could end up with a resurgence. And I, I'm also of the belief that it's, we don't necessarily have to, it can be done regionally based on what's being seen. It doesn't have to be done, you know, uh, the same throughout the state or even throughout the country. So I think, it, you know, there's, there's, to me, there's some flexibility in how we do this, but certainly the more heavily densely populated areas or the areas that are seeing more activity around this have to be very cautious about how quickly they get back to, to normal. We all want to get back to normal, but um, understanding if we do it too quickly, it could be detrimental uh, to all of us. I, I couldn't agree more. And, I, and, and uh, Michael, thank you for the question because we need to get our economy going again, but we, may, we need to make sure we do it in a safe way and in a sustainable way. Uh, they go hand in hand. If we open it up immediately uh, and all of a sudden you get these blooms of, of, of uh, more infections, uh, that's going to be counterproductive and will swamp our, our health care system again. It, it, to me, it's pretty obvious that we, we need to do two things. Number one, we need to listen to our, our, our medical community and our scientists. Uh, and number two, uh, we need we need if, once we do start loosening up these restrictions, we need to do it in stages. You know, we need to do it uh, uh, for you know parts of the economy that don't require gatherings in in large large numbers, like movie theaters, things like that. But we need to do it smart, and we need to do it in a sustainable way. Matt. Okay, next we have John Arnone from Dallas, PA, with a question about tracking manufacturers in our area for COVID-19 infections. Go ahead, John. Hi, Congressman. I'm curious about, uh, besides hazard pay, what's being done to track, say, like manufacturers, like you hear about Smithfield and them shutting down their manufacturing. Is there anything going on to track our manufacturers as to who has COVID and who's doing what to clean it? Are the employees, you know, knowing about infections? Uh, thank you, John. It sounds like you have your hands full there at home. Um, uh, the answer is yes, but probably not enough. Uh, I know that, um, and you mentioned one one manufacturer, but uh, I was down in Hazleton last week, uh, and you live in Luzerne County, and if you've been looking at the numbers, uh, the incidence of infection in Luzerne County has been staggering how, how it's been weighted towards the southern tip of Luzerne County, and, and particularly in and around Hazleton and Hazel Township. And um, uh, it's something like uh, 90, uh, 92 percent of the infections of Luzerne County happen in that area. Um, and it, it was clear to me that one of the big factors was uh, what you're talking about. Uh, uh, there, you know, you have the whole spectrum. You have uh, very good actors, and you have, uh, uh, you know, the the all stars that 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 that, that didn't practice social distancing, didn't provide PPE, uh, didn't do what we need to do to stop the spread of this, this virus. Um, and so as a result, uh, I, I actually called for an OSHA investigation of, uh, three, of the, three of the companies uh, in that area. Uh, and um, um, anyway, that's what I did. Uh, and what the state is doing, I can't speak to, but I know that... Um, Senator John Udichek and Tara Tuhill, uh and um, uh, a number of the other state representatives, Senator Lisa Baker, uh, uh, very interested in this and uh, are probably uh, better able to comment on the, uh, on the state aspect of that. But I think that uh, OSHA is set up uh, to do things like that, and that's why I called them in. Okay. Uh, next, let's go to Kelly Stapleton with a question about loans available to sole proprietors. Go ahead, Kelly. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi. Uh, my question is what loans are out there for sole proprietors? Because right now it looks like if you apply for the economic disaster loan, it's all based on if you have employees. And even like the payment protection, the paycheck protection loans, they're all based on how, the number of employees that you have. So my question is, what do you offer for people that are sole proprietors of their business? 
Okay. Uh, well, for, uh, the first thing I want to say, uh, Kelly, is uh, remember, uh, you are the owner of your business, and that means you're self-employed, and you are entitled to put in for unemployment compensation. Um, so that's available to you, uh, whether you have employees or not. And and for the rest, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Joe Boylan and, and Steve Ursich. I'll, I'll jump in first, Joe, uh, uh, and, and answer that. So uh, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, I'll start with that one. <clears throat> there are provisions that just opened up uh, this past Friday. Uh, some guidance uh, came out from SBA uh, today, actually. So essentially, you would be eligible not necessarily based on number of employees, but based um, on net income, uh, average monthly times two and a half uh, or 2.5. So you could apply for that. Um, and secondly, with the economic injury disaster loan, even though the $10,000 advance is based on an employee headcount, the actual uh, idle or economic injury disaster loan is um, not based on number of employees, but based on impact. So you could apply uh, for those dollars um, for your business. Uh, the, the key to that is SBA has just been overwhelmed with uh, the number of applications at this point. So the response time is, has been uh, longer than they would certainly hope it to be. And uh, at some point, you're going to get assigned, if you apply for that, you'll get assigned to an SBA uh, loan officer who will be in touch with you and work you through the process of applying for additional monies if you need it. Joe, I'll turn it over to you if you want to add anything else there. Well, I, I think, Steve, just to echo your comments, I think, you know, from, from our perspective at, at Wilkes-Barre Connect in the Chamber, we, we are primarily focused on, on the uh, on mostly state programs, again, providing the education side on, on the federal um, into the caller. I think you can see the expertise that Steve brings. Uh, so what we've been doing is two things. We've been recommending folks either, one, contact their financial institution to understand the process and the ability and access to, to some of these federal programs. But I would highly recommend reaching out to Steve and his team at, at NEPA Alliance. Um, they live and breathe this every single day and can provide unbelievable expertise to help answer these questions. Because I think the thing that's so important to understand is information seems to be changing on a daily basis, evolving in, in these programs. So having a great resource um, to understand and navigate these is, is crucial. So I would recommend, again, either reaching out to your financial institution or reaching out to, to NEPA Alliance, who's been doing this for, for years. Okay, next we have Cecilia from Wilkes-Barre with a question about unemployment benefits and working for a nonprofit organization. Cecilia, go ahead. Yes, uh, I've been working for the Salvation Army for 17 years, and I'm, I'm interested to know, uh, it's a 501C, am, am I entitled to uh, unemployment insurance? Uh, absolutely, uh, Cecilia. Uh, uh, just because it's a nonprofit, that doesn't mean it's different from any other employer. Uh, okay. you, you should uh, you should be able to do that. Okay, we have another question from Joanne Sprow from Wilkes Barre about the stimulus checks. Go ahead, Joanne. Hi, I'm on Social Security. And I'm just wondering if the stimulus check is going to be deposited into my account that the Social Security check goes into, or do I have to wait because I filed income tax, but I get a check from them? And also, is it taxable? Uh, uh, the answer is uh, you don't have to do anything. Uh, it'll go into your Social Security account. Uh, and uh, for, for a time, they were talking about making you file taxes. Um, but we kind of uh, there was a you know kind of a fist fight over that in the Congress and and uh, uh, those of us who who didn't want you to have to do that prevailed and and um, uh, you don't uh, uh, so just the fact that they have you on file at Social Security uh, that's the way it's going to happen and uh, no that's not taxable. Okay. 
Okay, uh, a question from Lisa Murphy from Dunmore about uh, unemployment benefits. Hi, Congressman. Thank you so. Hi, Congressman. Thank you so much for having this meeting. Um, I really appreciate the information. My question is: I filed for unemployment, um, you know, back in mid March, and I cannot seem to get through on the system. I know I heard your comments earlier, saying that um, you know it's an overload, and they don't, you know, they're they're. Uh, their computer systems are ancient, basically, and you're trying to keep up with that. But as some of us are home and some of us in my shop, I work for a school district, and I'm not going back until the end of August, beginning of September. I know I'm laid off until then. And I haven't had anything be able to come in, and I haven't been able to get through on the phone, on the computer, or in any sort of way. Uh, it keeps telling me I'm not activated, even though I reactivate it all the time. And I'm sure a lot of callers that are listening are probably having the same problem. Do you have any timeline when that's going to um, be resolved or get better? Uh, Lisa, I don't. Uh, and that's why I mentioned that that's one of the top frustrations of this whole thing. Uh, because you and I both know that a, a majority of, uh, of people in America can't sustain uh, this kind of a hit can't, uh, you know, can, uh, th there was a study last year that, that talked about vast numbers of Americans uh, can't weather uh, a $500 emergency. Well, you know, uh, several weeks out of work is way more than a $500 emergency. And um, uh, that's why it's, it's, uh, uh, this is terrible uh, that the unemployment uh, website uh, it is not able to respond to this. Um, it's it's obvious that the reason for that is nobody saw this coming. Nobody saw a situation where we have to shut down the economy and people have to depend on the unemployment system to do it. Um, one of these days, I'm going to figure out whose idea it was to make you go through the unemployment system um, rather than just send you a check. Um, but uh, they didn't they didn't think through that. Um, but we you know we're weeks down the road and and I know that uh, the the state government in Harrisburg is working hard on on fixing that uh so all I can say is uh, try to be patient and uh, I share your frustration All right everyone and I just want we're coming to the end of our time here but we'll have time for one more question before we get to that I just want to remind everyone that if your question wasn't answered during this evening you can stay on the line after we end and leave us a voicemail. You can also reach the Congressman's Office via email through the website at cartwright.house.gov slash contact or call the district office at 570-341-1050. Now our last question is from Joe Mazzarella with a question about the Paycheck Protection Program. Go ahead, Joe. Hi. Hi, so this question is for uh, Congressman Cartwright. Um, I'm an owner operator of a few franchises with multiple locations. And while I greatly appreciate the help the PPP will give me, I was wondering if um, there's another, say, round of it, because after I get done paying, paying the employees, there's not enough money for me to pay my rent. And the landlords are definitely wanting their rent paid. They, I know that for certain. And part two of the question, is there anything that can be done with regards to insurance companies because none of this is covered under business interruption insurance coverage? And so therefore we don't, as small business owners, get anything back from that for all the monies we pay for our insurance. Those are good questions. Uh, and, and not because they stump me, they don't. Uh, you have, uh, 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 Joe, the uh, uh, the franchise that you franchise franchises that you have, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, more credit to you for continuing to to pay your employees uh, through the Paycheck Protection Program, um, and uh, that's uh, you know the, the idea there is that that is uh, uh, federal money that's going to cover that, but it doesn't cover your rent uh, now. Um, up to now, the rent that we have addressed have been uh, foreclosures and evictions on P 
people's homes, uh, single family home homeowners with FHA insured mortgages, um, you know, uh, families being evicted from uh, their their places of residence, uh, and applying to the uh, state homeowners emergency mortgage assistance program, things like that. Th that is um, that doesn't that you know obviously doesn't reach your situation, uh, but. What you're talking about is exactly what I was saying, why we have to go back to Washington and address additional parts of of the economy that have slipped through the cracks in what we've done so far. Nobody thought we were going to cover everything. Nobody thought we were going to think of everything the first couple of go-rounds. And that's why we, we absolutely do have to go back. Um, and, um, uh, as, and now the question of... Um, um, Business interruption insurance. Uh, I, uh, it's it's funny. Um, uh, I, I, I was talking to a bunch of lawyers. In fact, uh, my wife is one of them working on those things, and they tell me uh, you shouldn't give up uh, because just because uh, 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 some insurance company tells you that it doesn't apply, uh, that's not the end of the story. You should probably uh, look further into it. All right, well, Congressman, that's all the time we have. Would you like to close us out? I sure would. Uh, look, uh, thanks to everybody for, for uh, listening in. Uh, thanks particularly uh, to uh, uh, Drs. Dewar and Brinker and uh, Mr. Seipel and uh, uh, Joe Boylan and, and Steve Ursich. Uh, uh, I know we just barely scratched the surface of, of the questions that are out there. Um, but I'm not going anywhere, and we're going to do this again. And if you do have questions, Matt gave you the number. I gave it to you before. It's 570-341-1050, and we have uh, gone to extended hours so that we can answer, your, answer the phone from 9 a.m. until 8 p.m. on weekdays. Uh, we're here to help you, and thanks again for listening in.